Now we look good. Okay. Let's start with this activity real quick, just to make sure we're all on the same page. So all you got to do is write a function. Make it a function that returns true if the value you give it is negative and false otherwise. So the function is just called is negative. And if the value you give it is negative, it'll return true. Otherwise, return false. That's all. The problem's simple, but maybe coming up with a solution is not. <clears throat> I'll give you just a couple minutes to do it. Raise your hand if you're done. Raise your hand if you just give me like one more minute. All right, cool. <clears throat> All right, raise your hand now if you're done. Okay, more people, that's good. So, I mean, keep working on it, but I'll talk just a little bit about this. And just to really take a second and emphasize, remember before earlier in the semester, I was always saying, like, this course content is very accumulative. If you don't get what you're doing yesterday, you're going to be in trouble today and especially tomorrow. And I mean, even with this little activity, think about what we're including here. We're including a function. We're checking a condition with booleans, which we only just recently learned about. We're using an if statement. You know, we've got those conditions there that we're using with the boolean. And we're also like returning something from that function. There's a lot going on. So one, hopefully this demonstrates how quickly all these things kind of build together. And two, you kind of get a sense of how much you've already learned already in, in three weeks. Three weeks and whatever this lecture is, the first five, ten minutes of your fourth week. Figure, we're like a quarter of the way done the semester already, right? So, there are a bunch of ways we could do this. But, you know, maybe the most obvious is 
if, well, if n is less than 0, return true, else, raise your hand if you wrote that basically exactly, more or less exactly. Yeah. I mean, and the logic checks out pretty good. OK, we've got the function definition is negative. But remember, this is only the definition of the function. I can hit run a billion times, and nothing's going to happen here. Run, run, run. Nothing's happening. Nothing happens until I call it. Remember, there's, OK, was it equals is negative 66. This is the definition of the function. This is like grade whatever math where you say f of x equals x plus 1. You just defined it. But down there on line 7, I'm actually calling it. I'm now saying, OK, go evaluate your f of x where x is 66. So f is 66. It's the same idea here. Don't overthink it. So we defined it. We called it. And you know, it's good to test it. False, that makes sense. Zero. Can anyone think of another edge case we might want to check? And when I use the word edge case, I mean like a peculiar value that might throw it off or something. I don't know. Zero. zero. That's a good idea. Let's see what happens when we put in zero. False. Because zero isn't negative, right? So I guess that's fine. So there we go. Let's think. OK, if n is less than zero, then true. Otherwise, false. Any questions about this? OK. So remember that like return is very different than print. And I always emphasize this because every week at lab, someone kind of mixes them up because it's very easy to mix them up. That's why I keep talking about this. Just to emphasize, if I said print true, and, that's, and I run this, great, but I get this none nonsense down here. And that's because we printed out true or false, but this function didn't return anything. It returned none. So was it? is assign the value none, and then we print out none, which is just none. So just be very, just always be keeping in the back of your mind, wait, do I want this function to give me back something that I can do with it later? Or do I want this function to just print something out and then carry on? Because that's how you'll kind of know. If you mess this up, you're going to mess it up probably a little bit more as soon as you just get a little bit more comfortable with it. But the important thing right now is go like, wait, OK, it's not doing what I'm supposed to do. Oh, I did print, so maybe I should do return. Just if your mind goes there, you're in good shape. OK. Now, we could do this. I could write it this way. And I think everything is going to work just fine with no else. And let's check. Zero, false. What happens if I do negative zero? All right. Negative 10, true. 10, false. Huh. It works. But raise your hand if you're, if you're thinking, though, like, I don't like that. A couple people. So here's why it works. And I'll say just because it does work doesn't mean that this is necessarily a good way to do it. Because when you see the if and the else, it's very obvious what's happening. Here, perhaps a little less obvious. Now, the trick with return, whenever the function, if the function's executing its code, and it hits a line that says return, it immediately stops execution, returns the value, and the program carries on. Any code after the return is ignored. Let me show you in a more contrived example. 
don't know. And then when I hit run here, it's just giving me back the seven. You will notice that there are three lines of code after that return statement. But we are never seeing the values will I run ever printed out. And just to prove to you that, you know, these lines of code will in fact print something out in general, let's put these above. There. Will I run? And then we return the 7, and then we print out the 7 down here on line 8. Zoom up just a titch. Whenever the function hits return, it immediately stops execution, and all code that would follow that return is completely ignored. In fact, in this particular scenario, Lines 3, 4, and 5 can never possibly run. There is no way that, that those lines of code can run. Does anyone here, has anyone here got PyCharm open up on their computer? No? That's, okay, that's fine. But in some IDEs, in some programming environments, it'll, like your programming environment will even tell you, eh, those lines can never run. Unreachable statements, unreachable code. Because that's true. So what I wrote there is rather silly because the comp like Python can never execute that code. As soon as it hits a return, it stops execution. So if we go back to this example, I'm just going to delete all this. The reason this is fine is because, okay, let me hit pause on that. The reason that you're probably unhappy with this is you know that if an if statement runs, it executes the code inside the if block, like the indented code. So in this line, in this example, line three. But we all know that once the if statement's done, is it returns, just, it just skips everything else and then carries on to the code outside the if statement, which here would seem to be line four. But the problem with this is, well, the problem, the case here is, if we ever run line three, the function immediately stops. So let's think about this. If I put in a 10, is n less than 0? Is 10 less than 0? Of course it's false. So we skip it, we return false. Great. And that's correct. See what happens if I do negative 10. It's true. Why? Well, n is negative 10. Is negative 10 less than 0? Of course it's true. So because it's true, we then go into the indented code under the if, so line three. We return true, and then that function immediately stops executing. Any other code that could be in that function is completely ignored in this scenario, and it just, it, we just jump down to line six once it gets assigned the value true, and then we print out true on line seven. So that's why in this scenario, the way I've written it, it'll work just fine. But, what's clearer, this or this? The first one, right? This one? It's, it's more explicit. You might say, ah, but it's an extra line of code. Who cares? It's a line of code. If this was 1960, you'd have an argument. Now, whatever. I mean, I'm running this code on Google server somewhere, so I don't care. Doesn't even affect me. So in this case, it's very clear. The code is very descriptive. It just, if it's that true, otherwise false. It's fairly straightforward. So the alternative, it'll work, but just because it'll work and just because it's less lines of code doesn't mean that it's necessarily easier to understand. All right, so now, real quick, I'll have you do this activity. And remember the trick here for checking if a number is divisible is we use that percent sign, that modulo. Modulus, whatever you want to call it. And then 
If the result of that, if the remainder is zero, then you know the number is evenly divisible. So I'll give you a couple moments to work on this activity. And it's a little longer, so I'll give you a couple minutes here. It's not a race. Take your time. And remember, you are entirely encouraged to talk amongst yourself if you get stuck. Usually during these activities, it's, you know, it's kind of noisy in the room. I realize this year we might be trying to not talk so much, but you can talk. And, oh wait, I guess you don't even need to call it or write it. It's our, here's the answer. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I made it even easier for you. So here's the function. Okay, now do the activity. Raise your hand if you're done up to number three, the not divisible by. Raise your hand if you need just like one more minute to get that part done. Okay, I'll give you a couple more seconds.
Okay, there are, for not divisible by, there are a couple of ways to change it over. Who here, so the way it's written right now is it's divisible by. If you look at divisible by, all it does is check if a mod b is 0. If the remainder is 0, then you know that those two numbers, you know, evenly divisible. Great. So that's what we're checking. Okay, quick poll. Who did it like this? Raise your hand really high. I want to see. I want to do, I want to do a vote. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, 12. Did I, 12 or 13. I don't remember if I counted you. 14? It, when you put an exclamation point, so equals equals is checks if they are equivalent. Exclamation point equals means are they not equal. In some programming languages, you see it like this, I think. Whatever. But in Python, it's that. Okay. Did anyone do it like this? Raise your hand if you did it this way. Really high, I want to count. One, two, three, four. All right. <laughs> but this will work, right? Because it asks the question, OK, are those numbers evenly divisible? Yes or no? Then not that. That's all it's doing. And the last one I can think of is this. Raise your hand if you did it this way. Really high, really high, really high. I think this one may have won. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Yeah, you've won. All right. There are, they are all equivalent. And look, we're already... We're not very far into this course, and we're already starting to see answers to that inevitable question that always comes up the first day of class of, yeah, but if there's like a correct answer, shouldn't all our code be the same? Well, look, we just saw three different ways to do the same thing. And this is, this is a simple problem, checking if the numbers are divisible. It's just one little function. And we saw three different ways to do it. It may have been obvious to you to flip the true and the false. It may have been obvious to you to change the equal to not equal. It may have been obvious to you to take the, the whole question and not. Whatever, they're all fine. Is that a question? Yeah. But it's not too fast to use bool. Sorry? But it's not too fast to use bool. Would it not be faster to use bool? I'm not sure what you mean. Oh, okay, like the actual expression. Yes. Yeah, okay. That's fine. Is it faster? Mm, probably not in practice, but you know, yeah. In fact, that's probably the good way to do it. So now jump to this one here. See if you can do that with only one return. And this might seem like a bit of a trick question because it's probably easier than you think. And you might even be mad if you don't get it and then you see what I do and you're like, oh, yeah, okay. I'll give you just a minute for this one.
Here, raise your hand if you did it this way. No one? No one did it this way? All I did was just assign the true or false value to a, to a variable. And then outside, I just had, OK, well, then return whatever the stored in the variable. No one did this? You did it? OK, one person did. All right, cool. Was the reason, raise your hand, if the reason you didn't do it is you're like, oh, yeah, OK. Like, I guess that makes sense. Feels silly, but yeah. OK, a, a bunch of people, yeah. See what, do you, you know what I mean when I was saying like it might feel like a trick question? Oh, just store it in a variable. But remember, all of these cheesy little things you can do, like, oh, just store it in a variable, these are the tools in your tool belt. Use them however you want. Remember, you're learning the tools. And then I'm asking you, like, okay, with those tools, go build a birdhouse, you know? Go build a something else. And then, of course, the last one, and I realize we talked about this at the end of class on Friday. Return A mod B zero. Raise your hand if you did it that way. Okay, a couple people. Yeah, so we saw this at the end of class on Friday. Not surprised if you remember. But all this is doing is kind of cutting out the middleman. All it's doing is, like in this scenario, I realize this is divisible by and this is not divisible by. In fact, now it's not divisible by. But remember, if a mod b equals equals zero, that is an expression that gets evaluated to true or false. So if the result of that whole expression is calculated to be true, in the above example, then we go inside the if statement and then return true. If it gets evaluated to false, we go down to the else and then we return the literal false. But you know, we're calculating this whole expression to see if it's true or false, and then using that true or false to tell us whether or not we should return true or false. Why don't we just return the result of the question, like the actual expression? Just tell me what a mod b not equals zero is. True or false. That gets evaluated true or false. Regardless of what it's evaluated to, return it. And that is the answer to that one. And an example like this, like this is a joke in computer science. All new programmers will do this. And then you, get, you kind of get used to not doing it with the if true return true, if false return false. That, I don't know, it's always kind of fun to look at those and go like, uh huh. Like, you won't lose marks for doing it. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just kind of, I don't know, it's a joke. Any questions about any of that? OK. So what's really cool, not a lot of programming languages have this. So if I say, oops, type of divisible by, I don't know, 10 and 2. I should print it out, actually. There. It's telling me, well, it's a Boolean. Because when I ask the function, divisible by, and I give it those two values, it's returning true or false, right? And then what is the type of the thing that's returned? Well, true or false. Now, something that's actually pretty interesting in Python, and not a lot of programming languages do this, will let you do this. I'm going to put in the name of the function, but I'm not going to give it any parameters. So I'm not actually calling the function. I'm just mentioning the name of the function. And if I hit run, it tells me, oh, it, well, that's a type function. So functions kind of like have their own type. What's even more interesting is you can actually pass, I'm just going to copy this code. 
And th I'm going to warn you, this is weird. So if it's not immediately obvious, that's fairly normal. But if I call the function add, what does it do? Well, it takes two values, it adds them together and returns the result. Subtract, well, it takes two values, gets the difference, and returns the result. Right? You should be fairly familiar with addition and subtraction at this point. But I've got this third function down there called do something. And it takes three parameters. It takes an f, whatever the heck that's going to be, and then an a and a b. But what do you think? Like, if you don't know the answer, you're normal because you've never seen this before. But based on everything you have seen so far, Raise your hand if you think you might have a sense of what's going on on line 8. So not very many people, but that's normal. Because this is weird. Let me call the function. And I won't even hit run. I'm just going to type in what I would write to call the function. And then we're going to see if you can think of what it's actually doing. Do something, add five and six. Okay. Now, I haven't hit run, but take a second, look at it, and then raise your hand, just a quick poll, to tell me if you get a sense of what the heck's going to go, go on here. Okay, a couple more people. So here's what's happening. We are actually passing the whole function add as a parameter to the function do something. So down there on line 10, I say call the function do something, and you get three things. You get the function add, you get the number 5, and then the number 6. So the function add gets assigned the name f. The value 5 gets assigned what variable name? And then 6 goes where? It's still just positional, but now I'm passing a whole function as if it's like a value. So, if I say A inside that function, it means what? <laughs> Let's try that again. If I say A, what do we have? If I say B, if I say f, it's the function at. Again, note that I'm not calling the function. I am not putting parentheses here. I'm not putting any values. Because if I did, it would do the calculation then and there. I don't want that to happen. I just want to say, here's the function. So when I hit run, let's think about what's going to happen. f is the function at. So, on line 8 it says, okay, call the function add and give it the value a and b, which is 5 and 6. So then we just jump up to line 1. a is 5, b is 6. Line 2, a plus b, well that's 11, return it. We go to line 8, f of a and b is 11, return that. Now line 10 gets evaluated to, like, or just gives us back the value 11. 11. Now another thing that's cool here is I can do subtract. There. <laughs> this is a contrived example. But there are a lot of cases where this functionality is really handy. In fact, I can show you one. This is a very, 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 very simple program here. Well, I shouldn't say that. I should say it's a very simple of a complex, it's a very simple version of a very complex program. It's called a genetic algorithm. And one of the things I got to do, here, you know what, I'll explain what a genetic algorithm is. Imagine for a second you've got a very hard problem to solve. Very hard. And you don't want to solve it, it's too hard for you. You don't even know how to go about starting to solve the problem. But what if I tell you, well, all you got to do is generate like a thousand random potential solutions to your problem. 
Like maybe your problem is telling a robot how to navigate a maze. Just come up with random sets of instructions for those robots and evaluate how good they are. How good do you think they'll be? Not good. They're going to be absolute garbage. They're, they're going to suck. Randomly generated sets of instructions to tell a robot how to navigate a maze? Probably not going to be very good, right? But some of them are going to be less terrible than others. Some are going to be absolute garbage. Maybe the robot just stands still and spins. One might go straight and then hits a wall and gets stuck, but it went further, so that's good. But then again, it actually begs the question, what's good? Should I measure how far the robot moved as a measurement of how good it was? Maybe I should measure how far and away it is from the end, from where it actually is supposed to go. Maybe that's a better goodness metric. Or maybe I should just count how many unique steps, like cells, that entered in your maze. Whatever. Like, whatever the metric of goodness is, is kind of a question, right? We don't know. But the point is, I'm going to measure how good these are. They're all going to suck. But if I take two that are relatively less horrible, and like mix them together and pull them apart, and I'm going to put them over here, Maybe they're a little bit better. Just a little bit. Maybe not. They're probably still going to suck. But I'm going to keep doing that. I'm going to take two, mix them together, pull them apart. They're going to have babies, you know. Maybe they get better. Maybe they get worse. And I'm going to do this a bunch until I get a thousand new ones. Do you think these thousand new ones are going to be good? No. No, they're still going to suck. But maybe they just got a little bit better. Maybe they didn't. I don't know. But if I repeat this process, of like getting a thousand and making, putting a new thousand over here and then doing that again and again and again and I do that like a million times. In the end, you actually end up getting pretty good solutions. It'll work really well. But we've got that problem of what's a good measure of goodness? What does it mean to be good in this scenario? So down here, Calculate fitness in value. I have a function called calculation, calculate population fitness. And if I look at it, all it does is take a function. And it's going to take this function, and it's going to give the whole population is just the name of the 1,000 I have, right? I'm going to take the whole population and use that function to calculate goodness on all of them. But I don't know what a good one is. In fact, I have two separate versions of, of this goodness measure, of this goodness calculating function. I call it a fitness function. I've got two different fitness functions for the same problem. And I don't know what's, what, what's really a better version. I don't know what's better for me. Because, I don't know, there's a lot of ways to measure goodness. So, I've got these two big complex functions here. And every time I hit run, when I calculate the population fitness, it's going to use the fitness int value. But I have another one called fitness count ones. And if I want to change out all that complexity down the line in my whole algorithm, all I have to do is say fitness, no, no, there. Now, great. I don't need to deal with all that added complexity of going and changing all the function names that I'm calling everywhere in the program. I can just pass around this whatever I call it up in the fitness function. Calculate population fitness. I just called it fitness function. Wherever I use fitness function in here, I don't care which version it is in this function. All I care about is that I have one and I can use it to give me a measure of goodness. So maybe that's a slightly better example. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Cool. <clears throat> uh, yeah. So there we go. You can do this. Honestly, I think I've maybe used this strategy like maybe a couple of dozen times in my life. 
Many other programming languages don't let you do that. That's not an option. You can't pass a, uh, a function as a parameter, but you could, which is neat. All right. So as we progress, the problems that we're solving are going to get more and more complex. And it becomes difficult to know how best do I start writing the code to solve this problem? Raise your hand if you've kind of gotten into that problem so far. Like you understand the problem. It's just like, but okay, where do I start to tackle this thing? Yeah, a bunch of people. I'll give you one hint. What you should never do is just start writing lines and lines and lines and lines of code and then go, okay, let's see if it works. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spoil the fun for you. It won't. It's not going to. What you do, start small. Go like, okay, I know I've got to do all this, but you know, this, that first little bit, like reading input, I know I can do that. So let's just do that part first. Break the problem down into the dumbest, simplest, little sub-problems that you can think of. Like one of the examples we're going to look at next time is calculating the total charge for someone who rents a car based on how far they drive and all that. Like it's a complex problem. But you gotta remember, computer scientists are too stupid to solve complex problems. We gotta break those problems down into the tiny little versions of what the bigger problem is. So I have one big problem, no, 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 break it down into like a dozen small little problems. And I can solve those small little problems. Those are those, those aren't too bad. But every single time you solve or you write the code for that small little problem, make sure it's correct. Don't just write it and go like, yeah, I think it's good. And then use it somewhere else. Because imagine you wrote a function that you assume is correct, and then you write a new function. And then you're testing this function, it keeps giving you the wrong output. So you spend all this time trying to find out what's wrong with this function, when in reality it was just that function that was wrong. Imagine we have that same function called print. But whenever, I don't know, Mars is in retrograde, it kind of doesn't work correctly half the time, right? If that was the case, and you were trying to debug your code, you're like, why is it not printing correctly? This doesn't make any sense. Well, we want to make sure all the functions we're using are correct. Because if they're not, and even worse, if they're right, like 99.99% of the time, but that one more time you hit run, it gives you the wrong answer, oh, good luck. So just be... Be slow. Take your time. Be meticulous. Break the problems down into the small, simple, simple ones that an idiot computer scientist like me can solve. Big problems I can't solve. Best I can do is try to break it down and then solve the little ones. Okay. So yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, cool. So raise your hand here. If you know off by heart how to calculate compounding interest. Three, four people, okay. So the funny thing here is though, I'm willing to bet that all of you, gun to your head scenario, you could probably actually figure it out on the spot. And to me, the trick to it, the trick, to coming up with it is to don't think about the function for compounding interest as a mathematical expression. I mean, it is. But if you don't think of it that way, think of it algorithmically. Think of it as, okay, like if you needed to know what 15% is to know what your sales tax is going to be, and something costs you 1093. What do you do to calculate the total amount of tax? Multiply by 1.15. Well, that'll give you the total total. And if you just do 0 0.15, it'll tell you just, just the tax, right? So there you go. So you know how to do that. So, okay, so you know how to do that. What if, like, you wanted to find out what 15% of that total is? What do you multiply that by? Well, let's do the 1.15 because we're just going to keep adding to it. And then what if you wanted to know what 
15% on top of that value was? Multiply it again. If any of what I'm just saying is thrown is blowing your mind, it shouldn't be. You're thinking too hard. If I have a value x, and I want to know what 15% more of that value x is, just do x times 1.15. That gives you a result. Just make that the new x. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Does anyone know what expression we have? What mathematical expression we have to do like multiplication some number of times? Uh, exponent. exponent, right? Like the power of. Yeah, and that's going to be part of like the root of how to do this. The added complexity here is okay, but like what's the compounding period? Per year. Raise your hand if you remember. You probably learned this in like grade five, right? And then you probably never thought of it again. Raise your hand if you remember hearing at least the word compounding period. Keep your hand up if you remember what it means. Three people. Okay. That's fine. All it means, all it really means is how long does it take for us to do that additional calculation, right? Do you get another 15% every day? Or do you have to wait a month before we do that calculation again? Or maybe a whole year before we do that calculation again? Anyways, we'll pick up here next class.